Mr. Producer's back. Life is sort of back to normal a little bit, I think. He came back from London saying how they were talking about 80 degree days and how it was the hottest something or other on record and how miserable everybody was. And uh, he comes back here and it's in the high 80s and we're, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty miserable. Except that uh, I actually appreciate it much more than the cold in northern New England. So I'm sort of reveling in it. Hope you're all having a great summer. And uh, despite the uh, question coming up here, this question coming up is a, um, <laughs> there's no connection between those things. Hope, hope you're having a great summer anyway. All right. Uh, yeah, the question, I, I give this this kind of a title because I want to um, address questions that come up sort of repeatedly. And I think they come up largely because there's a conversation that goes on in the, I want to call it the art culture, the art school culture maybe would be a better way to say it. Um, and so I'm just going to take two different questions that are very much tied to each other in, in different ways, but partially, lar largely because of that. So K. Madge uh, says, oh, and I better, here, we, I better get this to full screen. Hey, Mr. Producer. All right. Slideshow. All right. Um, I'll have to talk to Mr. Producer about one of the comments one of you made last week about wanting a full screen for when I use images and so you can just follow the, the arrows better. I know a bunch of you are using smaller phones, so that's a thing. If you want, want to talk about that with me, do put it out there and we'll, we'll think it through. But um, that really is up, as I said to you, the person asking, that's up to uh, Mr. Producer to decide those sorts of things on an aesthetic basis, but also on a, you know, um, probably a sort of an average across the board uh, uh, quality that we need for different kinds of presentations. But um, so k Madge says, not convinced by DeCamp's outlines. Uh, this is based on, I think it was 309, one of the recent ones, anyway, 307, 89, 309 maybe. Um, and then it says, touch of corset advertisement. I'll show you the pictures she's talking about, or he is talking about. To God deals with real physicality, including awkwardness. So there's three, two or three different possible ideas here. The one is um, not convinced by DeCamp's outlines. I don't know if you, what you mean by that. You're going to have to come back to me because I don't know if you're saying you're not convinced by the truth of his, of his contours or what. Um, and I don't know what it would take you to convince you of the truth of his contours. And nobody could even do that for himself. I couldn't defend myself. I can tell you what I went for. And, uh, and um, you, know, what, you know, to the degree I'm maintain, maintaining objectivity, how much truth I got into my outlines. But I'm not sure what you mean by DeCamp's outlines. Um, so that's an interesting question. I'd like to ha see that, what you're thinking about that one, maybe even more than these other points. But now the touch of the corset advertisement, um, De God it deals with real physicality, including awkwardness. Um, uh, there's two different things here. One is this long, long, long history of people referring to Bugro and that bunch of work based largely him. It was sort of a kind of a sentimentality, um, uh, and, um, you know, sort of look like the kind of stuff you would expect to find on a candy box. And in this case, it sounds like Madge is saying, K. Madge is saying, uh, uh, it's a corset advertisement. It sounds like a reaction. Uh, <laughs> so sounds like a feminist reaction, K. Madge. Excuse me if I said, if it doesn't mean anything good or bad. It just sounds like that. Uh, God deals with real physicality, including awkwardness. So let me show you the pictures. And we'll just talk about advertisements, okay, first, and then the awkwardness issue. But so each of these pictures here, here's, here's uh, Vermeer on the left, uh, Joseph DeCamp, and I assume that's the corset advertisement. <laughs> Great corset, wouldn't you say? Like a skinny Durup or whatever the heck they're supposed to do. And, um, and then there's Degas. Any one of these could easily be candy boxes, um, you know, uh, advertisements for something. In the case of the, it could be the ruff on the, on the Vermeer, right? The neck ruff there. That's a mat, or maybe the earrings. But yeah, that's kind of a, I wouldn't call that a very exciting uh, put down. Not doesn't get us anywhere because the whole history of painting is full of various women's accoutrements and styles and many, many, many things. So I wouldn't go with that uh, too far. Um, and then the second thing is all obviously is the awkwardness question. Is there some great advantage to awkwardness? And I'm going to make a comment here that you can read because I responded to you online about this, but I think I decided I'd go ahead and like to share it, and then we can come back to these images just for a second. But, um, so this is my question. Does truth imply no beauty per se? As in, should we place our portrait sitters in positions that make them look awkward? Or find what about them 
or, or should we be finding what about them we respond to? Like using colors that set off the color of their skin, or is this a, uh, uh, or, you know, so that, I mean, so here we're talking about uh, uh, finding the beauty, right? Remember the Ang comment, he says, you, you see ugliness there where I, see, where I see beauty. He considered his mission, this beauty and truth combination was his mission, and you'll find the same thing with Keats and other, and other poet, poet uh, 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 conversations. So, uh, but like using colors that set off the colors of their skin, of course, that's going to mean you have a color scheme. You have a color scheme. Is that not, you know, is that not uh, decorating a box? So these are just kinds of fascinating thoughts that continue to be hang around us. But the fact is they've become pejor pejorative. They've become judgmental and negative because of their common, because of this common use of them in that way in, in schools, in art schools. Uh, but uh, so my next part is, or is this a realism thing of the type commended, re re commended by the ash canners and their ilk as the great be and end all of a brave new age? So it, have we now lost the ability to show a woman looking graceful? We can't do that anymore for some reason. What would be the reason again? So then if you go back to the realism model, what you really mean is you're showing humans with all their warts. Uh, even, by the way, even Degas at the end uh, was saying he wasn't so sure that was a good idea to treat women like animals like that. You know, there was something about what he was saying that actually was problematical even to him, that what his pictures wound up, how that how it wound up treating those people. And you might argue that he meant to be saying treating them as animals and not as humans. So uh, be careful what you wish for. It would be one of my comments on that subject. So, um, but I want to go back, I'm going to come back to these, I'm just letting you look at them again. Um, as I said, any one of these could be an advertisement in the right case, it might be for a tutu or some other, <laughs> some other uh, accoutrement in the middle there, if it's a corset, so be it. It's actually about a cup, uh, and this woman is looking for the mark that, that's on the bottom of this cup that shows it's authentically some very special kind of, of, of porcelain, uh, and the, uh, apparently, and uh, allegedly. And then the Vermeer course, which, you know, as I said, what is that an advertisement for? Beautiful red hat. So I hope those aren't things that we just sully and, sh and, and turn shallow the whole form with. I mean, we painters who are, who, who are painting from love are, are, are looking for what's to love. And maybe it's women, maybe it's things about women, but more likely it's actually things about women that are in the category or even about the clothes they wear that are in the category of, of beauty in the, in the sense of, of color relations and all those other things. So um, this is our field, right? This is, a, this is a color form, if you like. It's also a representational form. So there's, there's the interplay of all these things and there's very many ways of observing them. One of them is awkwardness and the other one is grace. Is there something better about awkwardness than grace? Well, the realism model may want to argue that, but it's also true that there are women who are particularly graceful, I and mean, no matter what they do, they're, they're graceful, their fingers are graceful. And what would we want to do with that, right? Except to acknowledge it and, 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 and enjoy it, right? Project it, uh, discuss it admirably or with admiration, um, uh, promote it, whatever. So. Promote it, meaning extol it by virtue of even making a picture that contains that kind of grace. So I hope, hopefully nobody out there thinks that grace in some way is a bad thing or that um, the particular clothes a woman is wearing is a, uh, in some way a, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is the key to the statement, right? That's, that's again one of those modern things where it's all about what, what is this about? What's this about? And I'm afraid we've lost our bearings when we start limiting it to what's this about. Illustrators, that's largely what your job is, but painting is, painting is a different form. It's a, uh, I've said before, illustration is a use um, of a form. You, you've heard me, so we'll go, you can go find, look that up. So here's, so you have that comment and you can, I'd, I'd welcome comments back on all these things in this class, but then I'd come to uh, uh, Chengis or Kengis, uh, or Sengus E, who says, I can't help but be curious about one thing. You never talk about the likes of Picasso, Van Gogh, De Cherico, Rothko, etc. Those who, are, who express themselves through personal visions and sought more the entity that guided them towards how something made them feel as opposed to what their eyes perceived to be true. Is this because the type of art does not appeal to you or are you not interested at all in them? Well, this brings up so many interesting levels of questions. 
In the first place, though, uh, I don't talk about these guys because I'm, I, when I talk, I'm primarily talking to students. I'm trying to talk. I'm talking to people who who need to get their feet under them. Even even the arguments for Picasso being whatever he is uh, takes this position that he had to have been good as a representational painter, and those are his creds. That gives him street creds. Most people will tell you that. I can tell you a lot of modern art doesn't include that. A lot of modern artists don't have what I call street. I don't even think Picasso does, but that's me being being really blunt. And I don't, I don't, by the way, I have no reason to pick on people. I don't mind what people do. I take more Gamel's position, which is that I, this is something, but it isn't precisely what we do. What these guys are after isn't the same thing as what I find that historically uh, man has been after, at least those ones that have survived time, you know, through the, the, the size of time. So uh, I'll show you those pictures, but let me just say a little bit more. First, those who express themselves through personal visions and sought more the entity that guided them towards uh, how something made them feel as opposed to what their eyes perceived to be true. Um, all painters are doing that, actually. Um, every painter who's worth his salt is actually being guided by, his, by, his, by, his, by, by a, a, a feeling on some level. Oh man, I meant to put something in here that would have been fun for you. Well, Mr. Producer um, took a shot of, of himself walking around uh, um, around uh, uh, that great stone monument in uh, in England. Um, what's it called? <laughs> for you guys, everybody knows um, Stonehenge, and it reminded me so much of that uh, of that uh, sergeant. I'm gonna have to show everybody that stuff. It reminded me so much of that sergeant with all these guys lined up in that field where these guys have been blinded. The the soldiers lined up in a in a in a field where people what had been blind were playing baseball, and, and these guys were marching, holding on to each other, and they looked like pieces of Stonehenge. And you do wonder about sergeant's influence. He was widely he was he had eyes, and he had seen a lot. So it's an interesting, really interesting uh, point. People said about that sergeant, though, that he, he lacked feeling, and I'm not so sure I even begin to believe that um, or see that. But again, the point we're making in, in terms of a feeling, though, typically is, and this comes through in the conversations per se that I was raised around, that is that your job isn't to feel, your job is to, is what you can make other people feel. And I think Degas implies that too. Your job isn't, isn't to see form, your job is to, let, to, to show others the form you're seeing, to let them see with your eyes. So that's all true of all of us. Um, uh, but if you ask me that, does this type of art not appeal to you? I'd have to say, yeah, mostly it doesn't. On the, on the face of it, it doesn't appeal to me. Sometimes I look a little longer and I find a couple things to like. I often talk about, for example, the work of, um, it's similar to Rothko's, I talk about the work of, um, of, um, of uh, Georgi Kepish at the uh, uh, MIT uh, uh, Visual Arts Department. So, uh, and I'd speak positively. So I, I, I'm not interested in doing this to trash anybody. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to show you why I don't make big issues out of these people. And besides the fact that I don't actually, they weren't what brought me to the dance. Again, I'm gonna just show you these first ones. This is the kind of stuff that brought me to the dance, right? Doesn't mean I'm sitting here thinking I gotta paint women. Doesn't think I have to put them, I don't think I have to put them in costumes or anything like that. There's something more profound than that that brought me to the dance. And I'm hoping it's, I'm hoping that you can stay within your own self. You know, we, we, what you hold to be true in terms of the nature of this form. And what brought me to the dance is all I'm trying to do. I'm saying, wow, this is worthy. It's almost like saying, here's a still, isn't this landscape really beautiful? And then making sure I bring it to you. What, br what brought me to that still life or that landscape and be able to bring it to you and show you and say, yeah, see, and uh, but just in the same way, our whole lives are like living out that thing about, don't you see why I do this? And so I don't find that those guys, and I'll now walk through them, I don't find these guys actually make me want to be a painter. Um, Picasso is probably the most obvious case. And um, the one on the left, by the way, I picked because it's a pastel. <laughs> I, I hadn't seen that before. And um, but there's not a thing about either one of these things would have made me want to be a painter. They do several things. Each of these do several things. They make me think that these people are incompetent. That's what they do on the face of it. Now, whether you think that or not, is another story. Uh, do, I, do I think I ought to be educated to be able to receive pictures? I think that's a huge mistake on the part of, uh, of, of students of painting. 
our first job actually is to communicate to a guy who doesn't know anything the love, the, 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 the reason for the love, which has to do with color relations and, 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 and shape relations and all those things uh, in, a, you know, in, in a way that, that produces that, 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 I'm gonna just say the love quotient. Uh, he, he comes a little nearer to doing that on the left one, but as I said, the, 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 that feeling of incompetence is hanging all over it from the point of view of drawing. And the right, that's not even a discussion. But, uh, but there's an interesting other side to this. This was Picasso speaking. And at this point, I'll recommend to you, if you want to see me actually writing this out, I've, I've written an essay. It's called Art and Revolution. If you want a copy of it, I'm happy to send it to you. I'm not considering myself the end of all this sort of stuff. I just wound up needing for myself to do a bit of research. And I had an opportunity to, to publish it. So I, so I just worked it out. But Picasso says, no, painting is not done to decorate apartments. Well, already he's separating us from the whole classic world. I mean, most paintings early on were there to decorate churches. I mean, they really were decorative problems. But then he says it's an instrument of war for attack and defense against the enemy. Now, I suppose in a church you could say this is an instrument for war against well, ignorance of church's, church doctrine or ignorance of, uh, or, 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 um, or just of immorality or something like that. I don't know that the church ever used that as their, as their idea. But, you know, you have to look into Picasso a little bit deeper to find out who and what he was to uh, appreciate what this means. But if it's an instrument of war, who's the enemy? And is, if the enemy is chaos, it looks like he's participating with the enemy in the one just above. So. I'm just giving this to you, giving you an idea of why this is hard for me to take. I'm bringing you now again back to the things that brought me to the dance. On the left is a uh, Winslow Homer, I mean, is a um, uh, uh, Millet, uh, the water theme in the river. I think it's called the river, the Hive. Uh, and the one on the right is uh, Winslow Homer. That, what is it about these that caused me to think this is a worthy thing for me to be doing? That, again, this doesn't. What? What is that? You know what I mean? I'm only asking, though, when you're a student, make sure you say, yeah, have this big yes in you. It's not some reaction against something, but what is that thing you're going to bring that, make, that builds people up, makes them, that brings love, that brings constructive uh, uh, awareness? You know, I say constructive in the sense of building the good things, even if they're just, even if they're just aspects of the brain or the body, you know, as we talk about that the plant studies that were done with rock music and stuff. Uh, so, but again, just reminding you that so you see it. Now here's the Cher De Cherico. Here's uh, De Cherico. You asked me about De Cherico. I mean, I think that's how you pronounce his name. There is a D in there, isn't it? Uh, Cherico. Anyway, in any case, uh, I guess this is called surrealism. Again, that leaves me first off with the feeling that the guy isn't particularly good at his craft. The glove on the right suggests that he's better than he looks in every other spot out there. But it's just that first feeling is hard for me to take from the time I was a student. It sets very poorly with me when I'm trying to figure out how to be a good painter. And I know that my first mission is to master the look of, 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 the look of nature, to be, to be good at that. So I've set, I set side by side with something like this. These are on the right of Gamel. Um, and I'm only, you see that I'm doing this because it has buildings and verticals and things like that. So the one on the right is a gamel, and I've forgotten the name of this thing, but you can see he's using the same stuff, and he's projecting, you know, ideas. So that in one sense, it's not any not inferior to these, if to whatever extent these idea their ideas and these things. Uh, and again, it puts me off so much. I I can't even interest myself in the in the uh, in whatever level of ideas there is, which is a really problematical thing for painters. If you have an idea and you don't paint well, you're you're demoting your idea. And uh, you're going to leave a lot more people not listening than listening, so that's a, just a skill thing that that I you know that I think is imperative if you're actual actually trying to illustrate something. And Gamel certainly shows considerably more skill in a straightforward way, in, the old, in an old school way. Um, not taking anything away from whatever the meaning is on those other ones, but I'm saying that that's one of those things. If you don't want to be in the room, you're not going to stay around for the meaning. Even Gamels has that problem of being so curious in its meaning that it would take you an awful lot of work to try to sort it out. Uh, he does achieve his original sensation, if you want to call it his initial sensation, of something being a little bit desperate and dangerous for this individual in the middle of his painting. 
And then again, there's the sergeant on the left, which is merely the observed, uh, uh, again, stuff about a building, but you can see it contains all sorts of sensational content, you know, uh, a felt content. Uh, so not more than that. I, uh, but again, this, this didn't inspire me. These things did. These are the things that made me want to be a painter. So do, which one am I going to keep going back to? You know, am I trying to move this way? Again, one of the questions is, is this progress to go to Jericho? Is that progress? Is, is, is they, that, that whole concept is built up is, with the idea that it's progress. Is man moving to another level? So here's a painter. Uh, the, the other painter you mentioned is Rothko. And uh, he says he's a painter of, of uh, feelings, I think is his word for it. Big feelings. And he talks about um, uh, uh, um, tragedy and things like that. And... Uh, and that's fine, that's fine. The difficulty I have with that kind of thing, if it's not uh, superficially uh, interesting by color or something, uh, you know, if I don't have a reason to look at it, again, is am I gonna stick around long enough to even understand that, what you mean by that? Uh, if you said that, I could certainly see that this one has a bit of something, something in there that you could s say is a little bit um, suggestive. But again, that's why I happen to like uh, 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 Gorgi Kepish better because he's very suggestive without becoming a uh, becoming a representational painter. So let me. Uh, but so again, he says he's not an abstract painter though, and he's not. I don't know if he'd be those one of those is not, also trying not to decorate apartments or, tr or trying not to. So uh, and then again, the last thing I'd leave you with just in that conversation is to read Tom Wolfe's The Painted Word. It's really kind of a big. Uh, piece of a conversation, and that is, do you have to, going back to this again, do you have to have words on a page somewhere to want to own one of these things? Now, if it's just a color field, and it would go in your apartment, it would go well in your apartment, and suggest something, then that's great, you know, but that's a kind of an interesting question, I've, and one of the things I've took from a very early age was I don't want to know the name of the picture, and I used to say, you know, if it's a Japanese painting, I want to be able to appreciate it, for what it is, not for what I what it says about their culture or anything like that, for, for what it is, in what way, right? And that's where I'm suggesting that that's a painter's mission and his painter's orientation is different. It's different from from the the the, um, the limited expression of a, of a of a of a story that you'd have to know the name of to understand what just happened. A lot of uh, religious art, early uh, Renaissance type art, is hard to understand for anybody else it's, if it's not interesting pictorially. It's not going to, it's not interesting as art, right? And how do I get again, how do I get somebody to listen to my Christian message if I'm not interesting pictorially? That's a fascinating question. I mean, it's one of those kinds of things, though. So I'm just giving you all kinds of sort of curious background. I'm not sure I should be doing this, but you're asking a question that's pretty personal to me. So I'm just going, I'm just going there with it. Again, these are two major inspirations. I wish that left reproduction was a little bit better, but but the uh, Michelangelo, it was so thrilling to find them stripping off this brown paint off these Michelangelo's where you could really see the beauty of this color in fresco. The nice thing about fresco is it's got the original color. When you clean off all the dust and the grime of ages, you really do have something much closer than many other kinds of paintings uh, that would have been skinned in that process. Uh, you, you have something much closer to the color they meant to be using. So the one on the left, though, actually, interestingly enough, uh, Monet is also so thick in paint that it's hard to skin his paintings. <laughs> At least these ones where he's got multiple layers of relatively thick paint building up. But again, the inspiration uh, is light on the left one. Uh, and you could argue it's form or, or color relation, you know, color scheme, uh, et cetera, on the right one. Uh, but these are ones that I would simply suggest to you. That these are the ones that make me want to do this. And that's, that was kind of like underlying your question. I don't want to leave on a sour note, but this wouldn't have made me ever be a painter. Uh, it's kind of like, it sort of represents to me like a tragedy of somebody who, want, who wanted to be a good painter and couldn't get information or lack something in his personality. And I, that's where you're going to have to accept me as the great heretic. But um, you're asking, it's a personal question. I have to say that there's nothing about this that would have brought me to the dance. There's never, there still isn't anything about this. His, the guy he modeled himself on, the guy that we, that, um, that he frequently copied, Millet on the left, absolutely yes. Maybe both he and I are brought to the deaths by Millet uh, in some very, very serious, very poignant way. So um, let me go back to your question, just make sure we're on the same page that I've not let something out. So does it not appeal to me? Yeah, so I think I've covered that. Uh, 
the, the primary thing about this work is I'm talk, as I said at the very beginning, I'm talking to students and, and, I've, and I'm sharing the work that commended itself to me and especially the work that continued to commend itself to me. When I was young, I, I, having read a book on Renoir, I was, I, I was rather in love, whatever the right word for this is. I fancied Renoir, that, that fell away and I don't recommend Renoir anymore. But, so the, some of these things are the product of age. But I'd, I've never pushed away from paintings and painters because they represent the modern age or anything like that. Uh, it's all been based on my self-evident sense that this is, this is that thing that brought me to the dance. And if I just kept saying that to you and gave you nothing else, but that's where I'm commending that you maintain your own sense of self-evident and your search for what is self-evidently so that gives this thing we call art, that gives it its specialness and that you stay on track with what you've found, with what you believe, not what you've been told in schools, and and in both ways, by the way, some to diminish some of the great art of the past and others to promote things for which you can't in yourself find justification. And I am saying, I'm finally saying, really think for yourself. For all of you, and listening to me, think for yourself. I don't want to be your, your guru, and I don't, but, but I think it's you're equally in trouble listening to the art schools and the mindset that so often is behind telling you who you ought to love in another generation like now. So I hope that can be taken uh, with, um, you know, for in, the, in, a, in a class of, you know, hoping to be not judgmental and just clarifying. And, um, and because it is what it is, and we all have to have that. We have to have a yes motivation, not a rejection motivation. So I'm just offering you mine. You heard me say before, I'm always telling students, Get a vision, get an idea, get a, get a uh, uh, reason to be. And then don't look left or right. Just keep searching it out and finding out get with more clarity if that, is that really it, is that really it. You're really trying to figure out what it is to be a painter and what, what, it, what form you're involved in <clears throat> and how to, how to fully engage it uh, and explore it and, 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 uh, and then live in it, right? live it out and become one of the bearers of that thing that makes other people want to be, you know, to want to be uh, involved. Um, so yeah, it's a yes, it's love, uh, all those things. Not an, not, it's not a weapon against the enemy unless the enemy is chaos and then we all ought to be fighting that one. All right, well, thank you all very much. Uh, this has gone a little bit long and uh, Nice to have you back, Mr. Producer, once again, and I would, uh, hope to see you all uh, in the next one. But um, in the meantime, thank you for your donations, for your comments, uh, for subscribing and sharing and all, all, the, all the above. Um, have a great week. See you in the next one.